Grace to you and peace in the name of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to be back with all of you today after being gone for two weeks and enjoyed leading worship last week over at Round Lake and Brewster and leading a couple of congregational meetings. So uh, it's good to be back with you and I'd like to welcome everyone this morning who may be watching either online or uh, everybody who is here. Um, and I draw your attention to the announcements in the bulletin uh, and a couple of things to, to kind of update everybody on. First of all, you notice we didn't have our Ash Wednesday service, so we're going to do an Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday. Uh, at, and so the schedule's still going to be the same. It was going to be 6 o'clock, we're going to do the spud hug, and then 6.45 we'll have worship with communion and the imposition of ashes, and we invite you to come and join us for that. Also, you'll notice in there the schedule for the uh, um, Lenten worship services, uh, the Wednesday night services, which we do with our Presbyterian uh, brothers and sisters, and then the Thursday noon luncheons, which we do with our uh, ecumenical partners here in town. So, um, so this week, uh, we are at the American Lutheran Church, and that's at noon on Thursday. Uh, there was one other one I wanted to um, point out. Let's see. Maybe that is the only one I needed to. Oh, I know. Uh, it's on the back here. A couple of other items going on. Koinonia is meeting on Thursday. And um, also Thursday we're planning um, the 150th committee, the sesquicentennial committee, uh, is going to meet. And we haven't got an exact time, but probably Thursday afternoon. So. Uh, that meeting also got postponed because of the weather. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns that you wish to share this morning? Those of you who are watching on Facebook, I'm going to start up my Facebook here on my phone. You can leave your announcements or prayer concerns uh, in, the, uh, in the chat section there. If there are no other announcements, um, Let's begin with a word of prayer. Holy and wonderful God, we are so blessed by your presence. We give you thanks for your gifts, and we ask for your Holy Spirit to bless our time together that as we worship you, as we gather together in your name, as we sing hymns, as we hear your word, we may be strengthened by you, and we may honor and glorify you. This we pray in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our lay leader this morning is Terry Schizel. Good morning. Uh, join me in the call to worship, please. People of God on this wilderness journey, what will you eat? The word of the Lord is our daily bread. People of God, in this time of temptation, how will you live? Our faith is in the faithfulness of God. People of God, at this kingdom crossroad, whom will you serve? We worship the Lord our God alone. Join with all of us, our God, our help in ages past. Uh, number 687.
Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Happy are those whose sin is forgiven, who no longer suffer in silence, but name their sin and seek God's grace. Let us confess our sin. We confess to you, O God, and before one another, that we have sinned, by what we have done and what we have failed to do. You have called us to live out your image in our lives, and you sent our Son to show us what that looks like. And yet we fail so often. We look for the easy way, the quick way. We don't want to put in the work of learning what it means to be your image here on earth. Forgive us and renew us in your spirit that we may be true disciples of your Christ. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Christ Jesus, and he is the one who died on the cross for us, who rose again from the dead, who sits at the right hand of God interceding for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. As forgiven people, let us greet one another, sharing God's peace. kids here this morning. So let's go ahead and join in our next hymn, Lord Who Throughout These 40 Days. It's number 166 in the purple hymnals. Scripture lesson this morning is Genesis 2, 15 through 17, and 3, 1 through 7. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Here endeth the reading. The Gospel reading this morning is found in the Gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, beginning with verse 1. This story occurs just after uh, Jesus has been baptized by John the Baptist. In the Gospel of Matthew, that's where this story occurs. Uh, not quite the same spot in Luke, but pretty close. Anyway, so let us hear God's word. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Satan, away with you, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This ends the reading of God's word. May the Lord bless it to our use and to our understanding. Would you please join with me in a word of prayer? O oh Lord God, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son. For his love for us, for his faithfulness to you. We pray that as we have read these words of scripture, that by your spirit you will instill them in our hearts and in our minds, that like Jesus we may learn from them 
and use them to rightfully uphold your will. Bless also the words that I speak, that in these words we may hear your word, that it may come alive in our lives. Through Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. I suspect by now you've all heard of that train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, right? You have to be living under a rock, I think, in order to not have heard about it. Something like 38 rail cars were derailed. A fire ensued, which damaged an additional 12 cars. There were 20 cars total, hazardous materials. Eleven of those cars were part of the derailment. The NTSB has begun its investigation. And they came out with a preliminary report this week. Mechanical failure was part of the report. One of the axles overheated. But they also say there were steps that could have been taken to detect the mechanical failure earlier and prevent the derailment and subsequent disaster. As one NTSB spokesman put it, we've never seen an accident that isn't preventable. I don't like the word accident. I hate to use it. Nothing is an accident. Keep that thought in mind for just a moment. Death and destruction surround the town of Erzin, Turkey. But this tiny city in Turkey's southern Hatay province was an oasis of safety and normality, while life throughout the rest of the region was upset, overturned by last week's earthquake. Residents and officials say Erzin suffered no deaths, saw no buildings collapse, and they credit that to a long-standing commitment and determination by their city government and the people who manage it to not allow the construction codes to be violated in that city. As a 39-year-old municipal employee said, that whenever officials realized there were buildings that had been illegally built, they would get them taken down. Now, some people were, local people were really mad about it. He said of the residents who lived in those buildings that were taken down. But the mayor held firm, knowing that a major earthquake could and would come one day. Two different stories one where they averted disaster and one where disaster became major. What do they have in common or what's the difference between them? It has to do with the willingness to cut corners or to prevent corners from being cut. And when we think of temptation, that's one of the major forms of temptation. Which, which sort of restrictions do people believe they may disobey at their pleasure with little or no consequences today? A building might, a business might break a law relating to safety or building ordinances, knowing the fines are minimal and not take into consideration the risk to the lives and health of employees or clients. During this season of Lent, there might be a sign of compromised relationships with the public. But what about the long-term results of future business owners and family members who carry that negative consequences of such poor decisions made by their predecessors? Lent is a time for us to review and have our relationships evolve so they can be repaired and some new form of life can be restored. 
Stop and think about that for a minute. So often when we think of Lent, what do we think about? Oh, it's about the ashes and, and feeling bad about things. But what I'm saying and what we read in Genesis and in Matthew point us beyond just feeling bad about things. It moves us beyond just carrying that heavy load of guilt on us. It moves us to look to restore and rebuild relationships. Temptation comes to us in those moments when we look at others and feel insecure about not having enough. Temptation comes in judgments we make about strangers and others, or friends for that matter, who make choices that we do not understand. Temptation rules us, making us able to look away from those in need and to, to live our lives unaffected by issues in the world such as poverty, hunger, disease, and all kinds of injustice. Temptation rages in moments when we allow our temper to define our lives and when addiction to wealth and power and influence over others or vanity or an inordinate need to control defines who we are. Temptation wins when we engage in a justification of little lies, small sins. You know, a racist joke. A questionable business practice for the greater good. A criticism of a spouse or a partner when he or she is not around. Temptation wins when we get so caught up in the trappings of life that we lose, light, uh, lose sight of life itself. These are the faceless moments of evil that while mundane lurk in the recesses of our lives and our souls. Stop and look at both of the stories or re-listen to both of the stories that we heard this morning. The devil, or not the devil, the serpent the serpent comes to Eve and starts to question her. But notice how the serpent does it. it. It twists the story just a little bit. It makes it seem so innocuous. Did God really say this? Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what God said. But then what does she do? She adds on to it. She adds on to what God said. Not just that you shouldn't eat, but you can't even touch it. And then the serpent says, whoa, no, 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 wait a minute. That's not really what's going to happen. And it makes it look good. This is actually good for you. God's preventing you from seeing something good and having something good happen to you. Temptation becomes that moment when we look at ourselves and what we may or may not have compared to others. Jesus is tempted by Satan. I discovered um, this week in my studies as I was looking at this that actually Satan wasn't a person. It's actually a word. Ha-Satan uh, actually means something along the line of one who's questioning, one who's tempting, something like that. We use that phrase, Satan, to describe the devil. But it says, that's what the, the, the word means in the Hebrew and Greek. And what does Satan tempt Jesus with? Stop and think about it for a second. Shortcuts, right? Probably the biggest shortcut was the, the third temptation, but, but Satan worked up to that one. The first one was, well, take care of yourself. Nobody's going to mind if you turn a few of these stones into bread to feed yourself. 
After all, you're the son of God. You can do that. And you've been fasting. You, you deserve this. When Jesus doesn't bite on that one, Satan says, well, let's, let's, let's show everybody that you're really God by, by throwing yourself down off this temple spire and, and, and let the angels take care of you. Then, then you'll have proof that you're God's, God's son, that you're the one. And everybody will look at it and they'll know that you're God's son. Satan doesn't say all that, but that's really part of the temptation. And then, and then to make things even better, he justifies it by using a couple of passages of Scripture one of them that we use and read and hear regularly out of the Psalms, right? On Eagle's Wings is the hymn that we sing about it. Psalm 91, I believe it is. His angels will protect you, guard you, so you don't dash your foot against the stone. In other words, he makes it look like, well, this is okay because Scripture says this is what's going to happen. What does Jesus do? He says, wait a minute. You're misinterpreting what those scripture verses are about. You have to read those scripture verses in light of the rest of the Bible. And here's what the Bible really says. Don't test the Lord your God. And he can quote the passage, but he's also pointing to the great big picture, right? We read the Bible and over and over again, we... We hear when, when, when people test God, when they, when they break God's laws and say, well, nothing's going to happen to me. We're testing God. When we take that shortcut, when we, when we try to fudge on maybe a building ordinance or when we try to fudge on our taxes or when we try to fudge on this, that, or the other thing, we take that shortcut thinking, well, it's for the greater good. What happens? We're misinterpreting the whole of Scripture. What's God's will? Finally, finally, Satan gets to the big one. I know what, I, what you want. You're here to, to, to claim the world. I have the world. I've had it since Adam and Eve. It's been mine. But I'll give it to you if you just take this little shortcut. Just bow down and worship me. We can see how temptations begin small and lead us down these paths that break our lives. So we go back to the very first one. The one with Adam and Eve and the serpent. What does it mean to have our eyes open so as to be like God in knowing good and evil? Well, I know that some people have argued in the past that good and evil is not a matter, matter of ethical discernment. It's not, you know, well, that's the right thing or the wrong thing to do. That's not really what, what we're hearing about in this passage. I have said for many years, and I think I am consistent with the, our Reformed traditions, when I say that that question is at the heart of the very first of the Ten Commandments. Remember what it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. When we stop and think about Adam and Eve and this knowledge of good and evil and Satan actually asks, well, you'll be like God knowing good and evil. We're going to put ourselves up on this pedestal at the same height as God. The serpent insinuates it's out of jealousy, maybe that God doesn't want them to be the same as that God. That God wants to limit our freedom, forbid our enlightenment, and we owe it to ourselves to resist. Think for yourself, act for yourself. Do not let anyone, even God, define for you what is good and evil. That's really part of the temptation. But as we travel through this season of Lent, we need to remember the rest of the stories. 
I intentionally stopped our story this morning in the Genesis passage where I did rather than going on because the story continues after that, doesn't it? We know that the story continues that, that they realize they're naked and they try to cover themselves up with fig leaves and they try to hide from God. And God comes wandering around in the garden in the evening and, and he's saying, wait, wait a minute, where are my garden keepers? Where's my gardener's hat? Adam, Adam, where are you? You remember, that's what they were put in the garden for, was to kill, till and keep the garden. They don't make themselves known. And finally, they, they reveal themselves to God. They're hiding from God because they realize what they've done is wrong. They realize that they, they had exposed themselves and they fully expected that God would zap them on that very day because they had done what God said was wrong. But God does something different. God initiates consequences, and yes, because of that sin, death is part of our lives. But God also covers them with skins of cloth. And he sends them out of the garden. And life is difficult. But we know as we read the story what happens. God's with them when he calls Moses. God's with them when he calls Noah. God's with them when he calls the prophets. God's with them time and time and time and time and time and time again. Ultimately, we get to Jesus. And God comes to be with us in the person of Jesus. And God turns away from Satan and the temptation, reverses the story. And Jesus then lives and dies so that our relationship with God is fully restored. And so when we begin this season of Lent and we hear of the temptations, it's easy to, to look at and focus on all the things that we do wrong. It's easy to look at all the temptations that we have succumbed to over the course of the last year or the course of our lives and to feel that guilt. But if you have ever paid any attention to things like the 12-step programs for Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or, or other groups like that. The fourth step is to do a fearless inventory of our own lives. To acknowledge all those areas where we have done good or bad. And then you're called to move one step beyond that. You're called to make amends. To talk to the people. In other words, the, the sense of, uh, of that moral inventory isn't to make you feel bad about all the things bad, but it's to help you look at yourself and to rebuild those relationships that your behaviors have destroyed in the past. And the same thing is true during this season of Lent. We do that moral inventory. We look at the temptations and, and trying to be specific about those temptations today so that we recognize ways that we might be tempted. So we can do that fearless moral inventory both in our relationships with one another and in our relationship with God. And then, then having completed that moral inventory, we can make the appropriate changes
We can make the appropriate changes. We can work on restoring those relationships. And we can do that knowing, knowing that God loves us so much, that God already has forgiven us, that God already has taken action to welcome us home, to restore and renew us, to give us life abundant. As we travel through this season of Lent, let us look at the temptations that we face. Let us learn from Adam and Eve and let us learn from Jesus, knowing that we'll never be as good as Jesus, that we'll be more like Adam and Eve. But let us allow God's grace to renew us, to point us in new directions. Let us begin the work of rebuilding and restoring the garden that we have been placed in in our lives by rebuilding and restoring the relationships we have with one another and with God. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, we are so grateful for the gift you have given us of grace, of forgiveness, of new life. Open our eyes, O oh Lord, to those places where we have sinned by what we have done and what we have left undone. Open our eyes and help us to, to recognize them, but then also help us to move from them to correct, to renew, to rebuild, to restore, and to live as your children in love and grace. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to join with me in stating what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen. Let us rise and profess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time, we bring to the Lord our tithes and our offerings. And again, the box was here as you came in. For those of you who are watching online, you can always drop your offerings off in the, uh, uh, at the church or drop them in the mail and bring them here we appreciate everybody's support, and we give thanks for the gifts we have received as we continue to serve in God's ministry. Let us bring then to the Lord our tithes and our offerings. Let us sing together the uh, doxology.
pray together. We give you thanks and praise, O God, for the free and abundant gift of grace you have given us in Jesus Christ. Let the simple gifts of our lives be a sign of our unending gratitude for your undying love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As I'm looking at the offering plate, I'm reminded of one other announcement to make. Um, and I look down here and I see all these pieces of white paper and I'm going, thank you. Thank you for those of you who are working on filling out the survey we sent out to you. Uh, and uh, if you would like to, if you're a member and would like to take part in the survey or worship here and you'd like to take part in the survey uh, regarding uh, the church, please... Um, please contact the office. Uh, we'd like to get the survey uh, completed here sometime uh, in the next week or two. So thank you for returning that if you have done that. And if you haven't, please return it soon. We come now to a time of prayer. Are there prayer concerns you'd like to share this morning or joys you would like to share? General, okay. Prayers for Jan Lowe, and I believe the uh, memorial for Rich is on Saturday afternoon, right? right? Okay. Angela what? Angela. Anderson. Okay. Prayers for her. Um, prayers for Randy Junker. He's dealing with cancer. Others? The end of the war in Ukraine. Yes, as we have passed the one year anniversary. We pray for peace in Ukraine and the end of that conflict, that war. Other prayer concerns are joys. Hearing none and seeing none on uh, Facebook, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Holy and gracious God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You have created this world in which we live and have provided all things, and, and we praise you and glorify you. We lift our voices and our arms in praise for your goodness and your grace. We pray, O oh Lord, that we can join with the angels and the great crowd of witnesses around your throne, proclaiming your glory for all the world to hear. We pray, O oh Lord, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and lived with us, who suffered and died for us, and, and who sits at your right hand, having risen from the grave and ascended to heaven. He sits at your right hand, interceding for us. We owe our very lives to him, and we trust in him and seek to follow him wherever he may lead. In his name, Lord, we lift before you those who are suffering from illnesses and injuries, those who have lost loved ones, those who have suffered injustices. In particular, this morning we lift up Jan, and Angela and Randy. We pray for your healing touch on them. We pray for your spirit of comfort and strength on them. We ask you to surround them with arms of love 
that they may know your presence. Help us, Lord, to, to be those arms, to reach out and support them and strengthen them, to show your presence to them. Lord, we pray for, for victims of all kinds of disasters in our country. Storms have continued to roll across the land. And we're reminded how, how little we actually control. But we do lift up those whose homes have been destroyed by wind and rain and snow and floods. We pray for those whose homes and lives have been damaged by loss of loved ones in accidents and fires. We ask for your hand to calm the storms of nature to surround us with protections, to keep us safe. And Lord, we know that you desire peace. You desire wholeness. You desire a restoring of relationships, a renewal of life. And we marked a sad anniversary this week, an anniversary of a war that continues with hundreds of thousands of lives taken and hundreds of thousands more whose lives have been upturned and destroyed by the fighting that has gone on in Ukraine. Lord, we pray for your peace. We pray for your peace and your justice that resolves conflicts, but also rebuilds and renews lives. For the peace that we know you desire is a peace of wholeness, not just an absence of conflict. So we lift before you our words, our hearts, our lives, and ask that we, by your power, may be instruments of peace and renewal in our world, even as we work for peace and renewal in Ukraine. This we pray. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And in his name we pray as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Today We All Are Called to Be Disciples. It's number 757 in the hymnals. If you have that, the words and music are on the screen. Let us rise and sing together.
powerful words we just sang. A powerful reminder of what happens when we succumb to temptation. But also a reminder of God's peace and grace calling us to something different, to something better. May you go forth living in that hope, in that presence, in that gift that God gives, knowing that God is faithful and will bring to completion in you that great work he has begun. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.